uh, mandatory vaccinations have been taken to the highest level of the courts in this country. And uh, the Supreme Court has found uh, that uh, health departments are within their reason to make um, vaccinations mandated. Joe Ferretti joins us right now, attorney at law from the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm. Joe, good morning to you. Good morning, Rock. Good morning, Bill and Maria. Bill, good morning. And let's, Joe, let's talk about, Bill, you got your phone turned down now? I, <laughs> you know, I, you've never seen, bumbling, bumbling you, here, you, you, you've never seen an oxygenarian move as quickly as Bill did when he heard his phone volume up there. <laughs> and Joe, you know, there. if you make a mistake, regardless how small it is, it comes back to bite you big time. That one with the microphone. Okay, Bill, you, you look good on TV this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Not disgusting. <enough. laughs> uh, Joe, tell, tell us about the Supreme Court decision in regards to mandated vaccines. Rob, this issue goes back to 1905, the case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts, when smallpox was still uh, quite an issue in this country. And at that time, uh, smallpox was pretty lethal, uh, up to a 30 percent mortality rate if you contracted the, the disease. So it was a big issue. And all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, came the issue of whether or not the government could mandate. In this case, it was the state of Massachusetts could mandate that its citizens receive a vaccine for smallpox. Now, the vaccine for smallpox, Rob, was developed all the way back in the 1790s when it was discovered that people exposed to cowpox uh, who got smallpox would only suffer mild cases of it. And so they began to develop this vaccine well before the Supreme Court case in 1905. But in 1905, our U.S. Supreme Court uh, decided that the greater good would trump individual rights in this case. And, and it's a lesson to us all in terms of how our individual rights are in balance with the greater good. Uh, the philosophers that uh, you go back to John Stuart Mill or Jeremy Bentham, uh, they all talked about utilitarianism and how our natural rights are actually really rights of utility. Uh, who benefits and, and who does not benefit from the exercise of those rights. And the Supreme Court, borrowing heavily from those philosophers, said that the greater good outweighs the needs of the individual in this case. But interestingly, in that Supreme Court case, it was recognized that in, as the court said, extreme cases where there was a history of reactions to vaccines, health reasons why maybe somebody shouldn't be vaccinated, the courts would recognize the individual's right to not be vaccinated. And I think that was the origin of many of the exemptions to mandatory vaccines you see today for health reasons. Bill? Yeah, so for health reasons, uh, they did not differentiate uh, religious uh, grounds or, or anything else other than just a known or predictable health reaction. Is that correct, Joe? That's right. In fact, Mr. Jacobson, who was the plaintiff in the Jacobson versus Massachusetts case, was a pastor. And he cited many reasons why he should not be vaccinated, uh, some of them based upon his religious beliefs, but also because he claimed to have a medical history where he and others in his family who had received vaccinations before that time had suffered medical complications. And the court, that, and that's why the court addressed the fact that in some situations where there are bad medical reactions, there shall be exemptions to mandatory vaccines. Is there a national database that, uh, that uh, people can go to and to see who has received, who has had a negative reaction? I'm thinking about if I was parent of a child and if I thought my child was, was vulnerable, uh, what resource could I go to? Uh, for that Pacific uh, Pacific child, yeah, there is Bill. Uh, there is a, uh, and I forget the acronym for the uh, the organization, the, the government agency that collects this information. But you can report to the federal government any adverse consequences of receiving a vaccine, uh, specifically the medical complications that some people do experience. And no matter how mild, whether you break out in a rash, or have a fever, or a sore arm versus anaphylaxis, uh, you can make those reports to this uh, agency. The data is collected. And not only is there a data uh, bank of information available for the FDA, the CDC, National Institutes of Health to study and monitor, 
There is also a federal government program that will compensate victims of vaccines who suffer medical complications and incur medical bills, uh, lost wages, things of that nature. You can actually make a claim for compensation. And, of course, that government program was designed to encourage people to get vaccinated and to have recourse if they suffered consequences of that vaccine. Maria. So, Joe, is the situation now as it stands, if a child, if a parent of a child wants to send their child to public school in West Virginia, but doesn't want to have them vaccinated, you know, with the the prescribed um, need for vaccinations getting into kindergarten, can they file some sort of um you know, paperwork that says this is why I don't want this to happen, or is this just all or nothing? They can't um, have their child enrolled in public school if they don't have the prerequisite uh, vaccinations. Yeah, what, what's going on today, Maria, in, in the current state of law in West Virginia is if you have a child entering kindergarten and the vaccines are not up to date, which start, at, I believe, at age one for these children, uh, the uh, and the parent does not want the child vaccinated, the parent typically will go to a family physician, uh, the primary care doctor for that child, and get an excuse, a medical excuse, saying, hey, there are reasons why my child should not be vaccinated, and here they are, and this is signed off by a doctor. Uh, Those claims for exemptions will be honored in the state of West Virginia. What is still in a state of flux, of course, is the religious exemptions which the legislature discussed and, and is now, uh, at least with regard to certain schools in West Virginia, pending on the governor's desk. And and we had that situation um, very different, of course, in the healthcare world, I think, with the COVID vaccine. I mean, That's, it was yeah. mandated um, if you had a, a health reason or a religious exemption. And I mean, I know at hospice, we looked at, at all of those and um, and I'm sure larger medical systems did um, as well, but it was kind of the the premise of for the greater good. And I also think, um, I remember I'm hearkening back to the discussion um, uh, with Dr. Moss at the Stubblefield Institute and a, uh, a lot of other folks, um, including the czar, um, whose name is escaping. Marsh, Marsh. Yes, Dr. Marsh. Um, talking about what we didn't know about COVID. And of course, this is, you know, we were learning as we went along. And so that was part of the issue. I mean, I certainly know many people who got the vaccine and then still got the virus, but the argument is that you didn't get it to the same degree. So again, different, but maybe not. Yeah, I want want to keep this more on the legal end of things with Joe here. And and Joe, are there any other cases or precedents set where the the court ruled in favor of the greater good of the public as opposed to the individual rights that you are aware of? Well, some of the examples that Maria was talking about uh, with regard to what we went through with COVID. Well, I mean, non-vaccine. I mean, is there anything else other than the vaccine realm? Oh, oh, sure. Uh, in terms of the greater good, uh, yeah. I, I mean, we have uh, plenty of court decisions where your life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness can be denied by the state, by the government. Uh, and and we, we have these discussions all the way up to uh, capital punishment, where, you know, your, your right to life is taken away by the state. Uh, and, and it's because uh, uh, courts have decided over time, as long as it's not cruel and unusual, the state can take away your life because the greater good is served by appropriate punishments for heinous crimes uh, and and the effect that they has on people to, you know, behave and, and, and live their life the right way, uh, as opposed to having, you know, complete uh, anarchy in terms of uh, what, what laws we follow. So in many respects, uh, there are court decisions where state power and state uh, state and federal government authority is being upheld. Uh, where the greater good is served over the rights of the individual. It's why, Rob, you have if you want to have a parade and your right to assemble uh, honored uh, in downtown Martinsburg, you have to go get a permit to do that. Mm-hmm. And you have to be approved before you can actually conduct that affair. Uh, and it's because uh, we have to have policing in place and we have to safeguard the public in terms of uh, the 
the, the problems associated with having a parade and stopping traffic and commerce and things of that nature. So we're weighing our rights all the time, uh, individual versus the, the greater good. And, and I think time and again, the courts have upheld the rights of, of the state and the government to exercise their authority. Another example would be forced quarantine. That mm-hmm. uh, if you've been exposed to a, any disease, you frequently have to be quarantined in place. Well, the masking mandates, yeah. okay, not a vaccine, but uh, that went through the court systems. Didn't go to the Supreme Court, but at the appellate court level, relying on Jacobson, by the way, uh, some appellate courts upheld mask mandates, uh, even though people objected to them and, and, and came forth with medical evidence as to why they were deleterious to their health. Uh, yet the courts upheld the ability of schools and, and workplaces to have mask mandates. So uh, it, it's... Again, it's uh, uh, time and again we see lessons learned about the balancing that takes place between individual rights and the greater good. Joe, I appreciate your time this morning. There was a question on Facebook, two of them, in fact, is why is an attorney countering an opinion of a doctor? And I'm not trying to counter the opinion of the doctor. We've done that already with Dr. Moffat. Uh, Joe is here specifically to address the Supreme Court upholding a decision that you can do a vaccine mandate. This has nothing to do with Joe's medical understanding of the effectiveness of vaccines, just strictly oh, to heaven, interpret no. the Supreme Court's case, <laughs> right? No, Rob, I, I stay in my lane. <laughs> yeah, and in this, this was the point of this interview was to be in the legal lane of things. We've already addressed ad nauseum the other side of the vaccine story. I saw no reason to follow Dr. Moss with another doctor who was going to give us the side of the vaccine story. We've already covered five times. So there's my explanation for that. And Joe, I thank you very much for your time this morning. We will talk to you again Friday. Always fun, Rob. Thank you. Have a great day, sir.